Uh, okay, welcome everyone. And uh, this is the seventh chapter of the IFLP book. Uh, so we have already covered uh, many variances of linear regression models. Uh, we even covered in the last chapter how it can be improved uh, with techniques such as Rich and Lasso. Uh, however, despite regression models having uh, good, good capabilities for inference, sometimes uh, their predictive capabilities are not as strong suited uh, for what we would like. So in that sense, in this chapter, we're going to uh, learn about more techniques to uh, still working with interpretable models of regression fashion. Uh, how can we make them uh, more powerful as predictors? So some of the techniques that we are going to be co uh, learning today are about polynomial regression. So no longer only linear functions, uh, step functions, regression splines, uh, some variations uh, where we combine some of the penalty terms that we saw in the previous chapter, in this case for smoothing splines, and then a variance of the other methods. This one's already mentioned, that is called local regression. And finally, a generalization of these five techniques, because we are, we are going to be working in a, a scenario with one response variable and only one predictor. So in order to consider the, the usual case, that is many predictors, we are going to be covering this part about generalized additive models. Uh, I didn't really understand this part of the of the notes. Uh, sorry, these are the notes from the ISLR booklet. They have this photo and I don't know what it means, but whatever, we can continue. You have, you have to ask, you know, the one that presented, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. chapter, you know, with the photo, yeah. <laughs> I probably explained in the in the meeting, in the recording. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, okay, so the first part, uh, we have been working with linear models. So, um, a natural step forward would be to consider not a polynomial one degree, but a degree d polynomial, where d is any natural number greater than one. So it does, in that sense, our mathematical model, where we have some uh, value of the prediction and some estimation, est estimate of the, of the pattern that uh, predicts the response out of a combination of the, in this case, only one predictor value. The mathematical form would be this one, a polynomial. Uh, these are the coefficients, and as we can see, we're considering only one predictor, but many different powers of it. So these items. Uh, well, over here, this would be the code for the actual graphics. Although they could, they could, they could be simply copy pasted. Uh, but the idea is that working with the wage data set, we compare these two variables, the predictor H and the response wage. And as we can see, uh, well, it's pretty clear that there is not quite a linear relationship with doing those. But if we fit, for example, in this first scenario, a four degree polynomial, you see in this type of model over here, and then estimating the coefficient via simple, uh, the same method that we saw for linear regression, as if these and these items were different predictors. Then we can estimate those coefficients. And uh, for this particular example, the, the four degree polynomial that we would get looks like this curve in green. And still we can see that it is a pretty bad fit. Uh, but that's because of the nature of the of this uh, specific data. And then they perform in a similar fashion. Uh, we saw that even for logistic regression, well, binary logistic regression, uh, this type of expression also appears, uh, not when you are estimating the, the response, but I think it was a probability of the response or the odds of the of the response, something like that. Uh, 
Still, we, we did get this kind of formula, so we can do something similar in that scenario. And in particular, if the class or, or the event that we're interested in, in predicting is the probability, for example, that the wage is higher than 250, then if that is our, uh, let's call it success event, then we can construct a binary logistic regression Okay, for that, and then estimating our model, as uh, we saw via this formula, then we get this type of score in green. Uh, and and the other the other lines are these points, but they have been shifted uh, via twice the standard deviation, I think of the coefficients or something like that. I don't quite remember. It's in the book. Ah, thank you, Ricardo. Senta the link. Polynomial regression using stats model. Uh, okay. And then. Uh, well, we can also treat a. Uh, the degree of the polynomial D as an hyper hyperparameter. So in a practical scenario, it could be estimated. And we have been working uh, with estimating hyperparameters via cross-validation. Um, um, and, and this comment is important. It comes in hand with uh, a type of model that we construct later on. And that is that the behavior of these polynomial models in the tails, so in the low and high values of the predictor, uh, they are actually quite bad. They are no, they not quite represent the data in that in those ranges. So in that sense, they are bad for extrapolation. So that's the first scenario of working with a global case, uh, fitting a polynomial function. In for all of the data. Now, instead of working with polynomials, we can use a uh, even simpler type of functions. Uh, well, they are called uh, indicator functions, uh, and those are the type of functions that we are going to be working with. This is scenario of step functions, so functions that that look almost like a staircase, but not necessarily only up. They can also go down. Uh, but here I think it's the code for the graph that they could have copy pasted. Uh, so we're, we're, we're working still with the same data, age and wage, but now we're using a step functions in order to build the model. So I think they didn't write it, but uh, it could be useful to show it. It's in the book. Uh, it's just, it, they are these ones over here. So you transform the the no wait uh, yeah first the range of your predictor you divide it into some parts so you fix the number of cut points for the range in this case it shows k and then you define some uh, k plus one new variables uh, for example this first variable that is based on the predictor is simply the outcome well it's simply the this indicator function corresponding to this interval so giving an, an observation uh, and we apply it to this uh, new function it simply says if the observation is smaller than c1 then we get a one but if it is greater or equal to c1 then we get a zero these indicator functions uh, they return a one in the case of a success for this condition and zero otherwise. So we can see the model for the, well, the mathematical formula, let's call it, for the prediction, for, sorry, for our estimate of the, of the prediction, it changes. And it basically looks like this. So no longer powers of X, but these transformations of X. 
Uh, and a similar type of formula can, can be applied for what we saw for for the, for the case of binary logistic regression, it's still predicting if the wage is greater than 250. So once we fit this model, it still be a simple, uh, simple fashion of what we have been working with for linear regression. As we, as we estimate these coefficients, then the actual estimate estimated function looks like this in green. It is still pretty bad because of the nature of this data set. And the uh, estimate for the probabilities, depending on the age, uh, it changed to this fashion. So uh, it exhibits that uh, kind of behavior that I mentioned about the staircase kind of shape. Because it's, uh, it is uh, locally constant. A locally constant function or piecewise constant. Uh, but one one of the advantages of using this type this type of function, step functions, is that there are probably the simple the, the simplest the simplest the more simple uh, functions to interpret, uh, and that is also apparent for what we are going to be covering in the next chapter about rebase methods, because you are also kind of performing a regression using indicator functions. Uh, okay, uh, and they also mentioned some, the, a comment about, well, we chose K cut points for the range, but why K and also which specific cut points do we choose? Uh, well, that, range, that question is going to be answered in a later part in this chapter, but still, it is important to bring it up. To bring it up. Uh, let's see, it says then piecewise polynomials. Uh, in this case, we're changing our perspective from global to local. In the start, we fit globally, that is for all of the data, uh, polynomial, but we see, we saw that it exhibits some weird behavior, in particular about the overfit of the data. If you allow quite a high degree for a polynomial, then you will probably end up overfitting your model to the data. And also the problem with the days that these polynomials, they are usually, they usually don't work quite well as predictors in the tail sections of the data, so low and high values. So in that sense, a simple way to to try to remedy, remedy, not alleviate that situation is to change our, our perspective from global to local. And so it, in that sense, as we did, for example, for here, for these step functions, we're going to be fitting a model, but over, partitions of the range of our predictor. So uh, as I mentioned, instead of uh, fitting a single polynomial over the whole domain of the predictor, we're going to be defining the polynomial by regions. And these regions, as well as in the case of the step functions, they are defined by the nodes, that is by the cut, the cut points that we, that we define. Uh, and we're going to be looking also at some problems that arise if you uh, if you don't add the restriction of continuity for these different polynomials that we're going to be fitting. They probably have the picture over here in the next part. Um, no, they don't. So I will show it in the book. So uh, this new model is actually similar to the one that we saw for the step functions case. And that is because this type of model, that is it explains, uh, yep. uh, and the step functions, uh, they are a particular case of what it is called using basis functions. So in this particular scenario of uh, locally fitting polynomials, 
this type of functions be one, be two, up to be, up to be k plus one. And we are going to choose, choose those functions to be polynomials. Uh, well, they can be up to any degree, although they usually are only up to degree three or four, because if not, uh, your model becomes too flexible. But how do they look? Uh, no, let's probably show better in the pictures in the book. They, they don't seem to have based this method. Over here, this is quite an interesting example. Probably that it's just, uh, okay, over here. About the issue with the continuity of the polynomials that we're going to be defining over the different regions, but the continuity at the cut points. So we consider a very simple case of only using work one cut point and the polynomials that we're going to be fitting are only uh, quick polynomials. So in that case, for this partition of the range, the function that estimates the response would look like this. It's a quick polynomial. And for the other region of the range, our estimated function, it's another quick polynomial. As we can see, the coefficients are also different. So in particular, for this scenario of one cut point and piecewise quick polynomials, we would need to estimate uh, one, two, three, four, eight different coefficients. And also in the same fashion that we saw for the inauguration, but region by region. Uh, and this is, this is the interesting part about the uh, issue with continuity at the, at the cut points. For example, with, with this model in mind, this one over here, uh, when we perform the, we, we, sorry, we fit this model to a data and the outcome would look like this. However, notice that, uh, let me zoom in a little bit, so much over here. Notice that at, it, at this cut point that we chose the value X, uh, there is a jump in the function. And, well, we don't really like that. Uh, it looks weird. Uh, however, if we add the restriction that this polynomial over here for this region and the polynomial for the next region, that they have to, to share the value at the cut point, then we would get this kind of a scenario of a continuous piece cubic. And now the estimated function for the response look like, looks like this. However, even in this case, if we zoom even a little bit more, over here, there is a little bit of a B. A B that it is similar to, to this one, this B. Like the usual B that we see for the, the, the graph of the absolute function. And those type of Bs, B shapes, uh, well, they represent uh, non-differentiability. Non so if we, we we don't we do not only want for continuity at the cut points, but also continuity of the derivative. Uh, we would get something like this. This could be explained. And as we can see now the overall shape of the estimated function is much more smooth. Uh, and that is the main idea that we want. Even if we build our models region by region, we want that the that the the global shape of the estimated function looks smooth. So we, that we get something like this, not something like this with with corners. Uh, and that is the main idea. Uh, let's see. Uh, and one more interesting part about the the issue that we already saw about what happens for this polynomial models at their tails. Uh, and that is what they define over here for natural cubic splines. So in this case, we are a uh, region by region fitting cubic polynomials. However, uh, we make it so that at the, at the boundaries of the region, so that, that would be the first region and the last one. So those that represent the 
lowest and highest values of a predictor. Then in those regions, we don't fit the cubic polynomial, but simply a, a linear a linear regression. Uh, and that that indeed avoids uh, the problem that we saw uh, for details of this polynomial that they don't quite they make good estimates for the response in, in those boundary regions. Um, but even with all of these solutions that we have been working with, there is still a problem about how many cut points do we have? Now we was that the problem? No, I think it was the, the degree of the I don't remember. Was it the degree of or the cut points for this playing case? It was a degree, right, Ricardo? I th I think it's both. <laughs> Uh, the degree and the choice of uh you know of inflection points. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, because if if the degree gets out of hand, uh it's a guarantee that you're going to overfit. Okay, yeah. the, the model will be too flexible. So you have to be aware that if you do, you know, degrees more than three, for example, to the power four, power five, power six. Uh, you're guaranteed that your model is going to work fit really bad, and of course the choice of uh, you know of, of those in inflection points, right? Okay, to see you know which are the cutoff points that you want to you know you want to uh, 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 you want to get your model so it you know it it it, it fits the data in a general way. And again, if 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 you get crazy about those uh, inflection points, then of course it's going to work fit too. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's, by, it's, by it's, a, it's a matter it's a matter of balance. It's a matter of balance yeah. between yeah. the degrees of the polynomials and also the you know the the the, the splicing points. Uh, about the inflection points, you mean the cut points? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. When 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 you change, you know your 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 equation. Uh, okay. Okay. To adjust, you know that that part of your of your data. Um, uh, okay. So thank you, Ricardo. Uh, so mm -hmm. now in this part, uh, we're going to be uh, dealing with the uh, the issue that Ricardo already mentioned about these two uh, hyperparameters and how to balance them. That is the degree of the polynomials that we use. A region by region. Actually, they, they can be even different degree, but let's assume that it's only one. For example, using only uh, cubic polynomials, region by region. Uh, and also the number of cut points or inflection points uh, for our for, for our split of the range of the predictor, because if either them of them, sorry, if either of them gets too big, then the model will probably overfit the data. So a way to balance that. Uh, well, over here is that they propose a similar, uh, let's call it mathematical expression to what we saw for, I think it was for Lasso, where they use the square term over here. Uh, and the idea is that you want to, to fit the, the data, well, the response, using some smooth curves that depends on the observations of this predictor. So we want to minimize this MSC, but penalize it with respect to this value. And they explain over here what is that is secondary derivative, I'm sorry, the norm of the second derivative of this smooth curve that we fit for the data, uh, what does it represent? And they say, they mention uh, the second derivative of the function is a measure of its roughness. So if the second, uh, let's see, if the second derivative is quite large in absolute value, then the function is quite weakly. And if it is close to zero in norm, then uh, no, it's not quite weakly. It's actually more, uh, it would be a straight line actually. Well, almost like a straight line. So in that sense, it's over here. Over here. If G is very smooth, then, 
if g is very smooth, so that is if the derivative of this curve is quite close to constant, then this value over here that we are multiplying via penalty, a penalty term, it would be very small. Uh, and conversely, if g is quite jumpy, so quite wiggly, uh, then if the, deri the derivative, uh, it would vary significantly. And therefore, the integral of the norm of the acceleration will also be quite large. So just as a summary, the larger the value, the value of lambda of the penalty term, the smoother g will be. So the, the less weakly ish. That is the main idea. We don't want our smooth curve to be too weakly because in that case, and we can make the MSE pretty really, really small. So it's just a, a, a way to balance the wiggliness in, in a sense. Uh, so then they describe some mathematical technicalities of this. Uh, uh, there is also a, 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 a nice scenario that happens in the case of uh, of this. Let's see, it says we can compute each of these leaf one out for cross validation fits only using this term over here. That is this expression. Uh, in order to fit all of the data. The idea is that uh, similar to a case that happened in, I think it was in the linear regression chapter, uh, even if you're working with leaf one out cross validation, it turns out that there is some formula that alleviates a lot of the process for estimating the errors. Uh, uh, well, and that is uh, the case. Let's see, what is the graph that they show? We still have age where our predictor and the response. Uh, 16 DF. Ah, degrees of freedom. Mm, yeah, we can see, for example, this curve in blue, that is the one with the smaller amount of degrees in freedom, degrees of freedom compared to the red one. It indeed does look less quickly. Uh, quite evident, or, or we can we can also say it has a fewer number of inflection points also. Uh, well, and but that is in up to dot uh, up to this point, and uh, that is the idea of either performing a global fit for the data as we saw in the beginning for polynomial regression, or re or partitioning the range of your predictor into into regions, of course they are non they are non overlapping, and then for each of those regions, perform some type of regression, and then add this constraint of continue continuity of the first and second derivatives uh, for at the cut points, so that the global shape looks quite smooth instead of V shape or with jumps. Uh, but now we take a look at a different approach. In this case, uh, uh, the models that we fit, they are no longer uh, working with non-overlapping regions. Now they can overlap, in fact. Um, let's see, it's a local regression. It's a, uh, it's, well, it's a different approach. Um, now we allow the use of overlapping regions because now the the target for which you are going to be fitting our model, it's one specific observation and it's and, uh, and its closest neighbors. So in a way kind of similar to KNN. So for example, uh, well, let's see what this represents. This is not a linear fit rate over here. Uh, look at the regression. Now they are allowing for 
hay error del polinomio. Well, okay, this is quite different. Uh, about the part that I mentioned about K and N, it's because of this part. Uh, well, they describe this type of algorithm. You also be a memory-based procedure. It's because once you want to feed it, you have to use all of the training data. Uh, and that is because there is some type of, uh, of weighted uh, linear regression that you perform iteratively, so step by step. I think they mentioned over here. Mm. No, it's probably in the actual algorithm. So first, how would this work at a specific uh, point, as a specific observation? Well, you define how many of the neighbors, well, of the closest neighbors you're going to be taking into your model to fit, uh, then you assign weights to this closest neighbor, to this specific observation. Um, and, and those weights, they are also well, weighted via the closeness. So the, clo the, the closest, no, the closer a neighbor is to the observation, the greater its weight. Uh, and then you fit this weighted least squares regression to the model. In this case, it is just a linear one, but also weighted. And so for, for this specific range of the observation, that is for this point and the, and the number of closest neighbors that you specified, you would have a, a linear model of your data. And then you do this for, well, across all of the observations uh no wait i'm not i'm not sure about this last part Ricardo, do you remember uh do we, do we run the model for every observation or only for the observations that have not yet been included as the neighbor in some previous iteration of the of this algorithm Good question. <laughs> yeah, because if not, for oh, yeah. example, if we if we run it for one observation and then to the closest next one, then how do we, uh, how do we make sure of of uh, how do I say it? How do we make sure of the of the interpolation between between these two models for for the same point for for example for one point that in a previous iteration was a neighbor of one observation uh -huh. but that in a following iteration of this algorithm it was an a neighbor of another model sorry of another neighborhood right uh, so in that sense i'm not quite sure yeah but here what they're suggesting i believe is to try to try to tune that k parameter the okay weights? yeah the, the 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 one that divides you know the the, the number of tra training points right uh, the, yeah the k divided by the end. and what they want to do is try to see with that k which is the value of k that minimizes this uh, die equation in 7.14, okay? So it can, it, it's kind of a, it, it's kind of a, a, a ordinary linear regression, but instead of the of the uh, least square uh, formula, it's this, it's this formula, the, the one in 7.14. And what you want to do is try to see which value of K minimizes that whole formula. And then you get the, the, your your yeah. estimates, okay. At, at least that that's how I understand it. And this model kind of you know reminds me of uh, K and N. 
the 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 K nearest neighbors. Yeah. Okay. Although in Canaan, at least by, by default, they don't wait the the neighbors, right? Right. Or you could for the. Well, that 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 is going is going to be applied because this you see number two, you see a sign of weight, right? K yeah. I zero equal to K between those two points to each point in the in this neighbor in this neighborhood. Okay. So K is the I guess, you know, is the is 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 how many how many neighbors you know you are you are uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. counting for each. Yeah, that, that's why it, it reminds me, this model reminds me of K and N, really. Okay. And then what are you going to do is, you know, do kind of a loop uh, with different values of K, right? To determine which is the one that minimizes the formula. Okay. All right. Um... To get to, to get those, those those coefficients. Do you mean to minimize the MSC of, well, the global MSC or minimize seven? Point one four. Yeah, mi mi minimize that that formula, which is similar to MSC, but it has the K. Ah, uh, yeah, it's okay. a weighted MSC. Exactly, like a weighted, yeah. Oh, okay. 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 It, it makes more sense now, but I think uh -huh. I am I am not quite sure. Uh, if they run this model for each observation, and, and in that case, uh, right. how, how do they interpolate the functions? Mm -hmm. Well, these uh, linear regressions, well, linear functions that uh, they get. Correct. Mm, okay. Uh, well, that would be something to, to look for later, we'll probably share it in the stack chat. Uh, so now what follows is, is as I mentioned in the beginning, it's simply the, the generalization of these ideas because uh, we have worked with the case of one response and one predictor. So now instead of one predictor, we consider many of them. Um, and we can, well, let's, let's let me check if they put this over here or if I only base it on the book. Um, okay. So we already saw, for example, the case of multiple linear regression, uh, and we have we, we have also already worked with the case of the generalized additive models. Uh, for example, we saw that logistic regression was a case of those, uh, where you perform some type of regression. Uh, but not necessarily to the response, but to some transformation of the expected value of the response. So I think they don't have the formulas. No, they mostly have it in R. So we can base it off how do they how they do it in the book. So we already saw this. But now in order to deal with this case of multiple predictors, what they do is to try to evaluate them, uh, but separately. So for example, uh, in this case, uh, they are performing some function for the first predictor, another function for the second one, and so on so, three functions, each one for a different predictor, uh, and then, each of these, uh, let's call it different contributions of the pre of the predictors. They are going they are going to be simply uh, added up together for this final model that we consider as the estimate of the response. Um, So, because we're working with these uh, pre multiple predictors separately, so one by one, uh, it is faster than uh, trying to work with combinations of those. So, for example, as we saw in some of the exercises, when we fitted models, 
uh, with predictors x1 and x2, not only using x1 uh, as a term for our linear regression, x2 as another term for the linear regression, but also we use x1 times x2. So in order to get a sense of the contribution of, a, of them considered as a pair, but instead of working with them in pairs, so for so the pairwise relationship, if we use this type of model, uh, when we save time because we're only working with the case of separating them, and um, for each one of them, perform a transformation uh, that we have already been seeing uh, in this chapter, the case of only one predictor. Uh, it, it mentions that an advantage of this type of models is that uh, the nonlinear fits can make more accurate predictions. Uh, also, because we are considering these uh, predictors separately, then we gain some inference in that sense because we can hold some of the some of the variable constant and only change the other one that well the remaining one and see what is the effect on the estimated response. So as we as we see typically for linear regression, in that case, sorry, for multiple linear regression, in that case, these functions will simply be the identity over here and over here. So in that sense, we, we do not lose a, a lot of inference capabilities. Uh, well, this is quite evident because it, it's just a case that we have been seeing for the case of one predictor. So the smoothness of this function corresponding to one variable is still the same case of it simply is characterized via the degrees of freedom. So as we saw, uh, and now the, the main restriction is let's see, of, this, of this type of models. Uh, well, it is part of it here that we're ignoring the interactions uh, of these predictors. So if in, in the case that maybe that interaction was quite significant, well, we wouldn't be able to notice that in the model. Uh, I would assume that you could, as uh, we did in the case of linear regression in one of the previous chapter, when we fitted that to the x1, x2, and x1 times x2 as predictor, we could do that in a similar fashion. For example, treat, I don't know, x uh, over here, xp plus one to be some pairwise product of some pair of predictors. And again, treat some new functions, so f sub p, p, plus, p plus one to do it a sense of the, of the, how do they call it, of the interaction of those predictors for the model that we are trying to build. So actually that could do that could solve a little bit this type of issue of losing information about the predictors interacting with each other. And they mentioned that now. Oh, that's maybe they do mention that. Uh, let's see and well this is just a case of using logistic regression in, in this type of model. And uh, by pushing in it. Mm. So, yeah, that's the main idea. And so, as a conclusion, that sometimes changing from global to local fits can be useful. And that even in these local fits, we can still use some of the, of the tools that we have been working with in previous chapters. So like they did with linear regression or even weighted linear regression by regions, in this case, by neighborhoods and such and such. But that these aggregate models, uh, they do not lose quite of the inference that these regression models uh, have. So like linear regression or polynomial regression, but they do get uh, quite a boost, at least in their predictive power. Okay, and thank you.